thank you all for joining. I look forward to our discussion today. So here's just kind of a quick agenda. So I'll be talking about some uh, architectural um, patterns, blueprints to use for continuous machine scale. And then I will also be discussing some of the updates uh, with Apache Ignite, the, the 2.8.x. Uh, series, uh, especially focusing on the uh, machine learning um, capabilities and features, and I'll, I'll show some code at the end. But anyway, just a quick word about Apache 2.8. Um, over 1,900 upgrades and fixes, so it's, it's a major enhancement from the earlier version. So most of the uh, enhancements, which are across the board, across the entire platform, that they focus in kind of three areas. One of them, the first one, the uh, you know the production support. So those of you who've worked with Ignite know that we're very good at supporting very large installations. So we've continued to enhance those those areas to better support the 24 by 7 mission critical uh, workloads. And then the second area that we've made a lot of enhancements to the underlying monitoring and, and management API. And in fact, we've recently uh, released a, a very cool new product called Control Center that I have the link here that I invite you all to just log in. It's free um, you know, for, for smaller deployments where you can play around with some of the new um, capabilities that that product offers. And then finally, of course, I'll be focusing on the machine learning piece. I'll be talking a lot about workflow uh, flexibility. I'll be talking about some of the new algorithms that we support such as the, uh, the the popular XG Boost and some of the others. And then I will be talking about some of the enhancements that we've added to Ignite to, to uh, allow you to better integrate it with that uh, big and growing uh, machine learning ecosystem out there, such as um, other stacks, such as Spark and XG Boost models. Okay, so... Um, we're a top five Apache product. Everything that I am talking about here is uh, open source and uh, you know freely downloadable. So we're one of the top five, both according to the developers mailing list and uh, the user mailing list. And so you see some of the big names here where we're uh, up there with the likes of Kafka and uh, you know Cassandra and others. This is a, a little bit dated slide here. On the right, you see it's also dated. Um, but today we're estimating that uh, in the aggregate, probably about 15 million downloads have occurred both from the Apache site and the Docker site. So it's a very large and thriving community. Uh, customers, uh, our customers are organizations that have very uh, stringent latency requirements that they, they do uh, as part of their business, they do what we would call massively parallel processing, of course. Some of these customers have hundreds of Ignite nodes in deployment, and uh, they're processing millions, you know, in the aggregate anyway, millions of transactions per, per minute. So some of the usual players, uh, financial services, cloud operators, telecom, and other network uh, management facilities, um, logistics, so you name it. So it's a very broad uh, user base that we have here. So I will be talking exclusively about the, the stuff in the, in the middle here, the red, which is the Apache Ignite um, open source. Um, it's an in-memory compute grid, an in-memory data grid, uh, and or an in-memory database, depending on how you want to deploy it in the cluster. So we run on top of your existing database here, if you want to use this as an in-memory data grid, but we also support that we can be our own in-memory, massively parallel database if you want to use our persistence layer. So that's up to you how you want to deploy it. It's all included. And then at the top here, we have a number of APIs that we support streaming data from IoT, that we support a number of um, APIs that is primarily Java, of course, but we support other technologies like .NET, um, C++, Python, REST, um, and, and others. And so uh, it's not just the API support that we support a number of different computing styles, you know, workflow styles as well. So I work for Gridgain, of course, and uh, we're the commercial um, 
organization that we that we submitted Apache Ignite several years ago to the open source community. But where we make our money is that we add a lot of the the, the mission critical um, 24 by 7 uh, services, uh, the additional products that um, bolt on top of Ignite, as well as offer uh, enterprise level monitoring and management, security, auditing, data center replication, and a lot of the other things that these big organizations want to layer on top of the Ignite uh, core technology, right? So let's talk about some uh, deployment patterns here. Okay, so the um, let's first define what we mean by continuous machine learning at scale. So when we talk about continuous machine learning, and by the way, there's gonna be other terms that organizations use that they may call it online machine learning, they may call it incremental, machine learning, but the idea here is that um, that machine learning has progressed beyond the point where you do this big batch job and you deploy a model algorithm that you use for months and months to uh, run your business. But right now, because of all the constant changes going on in the business, new customers, new purchasing preferences, new health uh, related issues, uh, changing uh, network deployments, all of these things that a model now that is the result of a big batch training job that you, you have to build it from the ground up to support rapid change and rapid updating. So how do we do that? Um, from the very beginning, and I, I think many of you probably for our online operational data processing where we do transactions, you know, updates, inserts, SQL queries, all of those things with our in-memory data grid but what uh, I'm going to talk about today is how we allow you to deploy the model training on all of the machine learning workflows side by side with the partition data here in such a way that you don't have to move data over the network that you don't have to do massive transformations using expensive ETL tools and that you don't have to deal with the difficulties of dealing um, with two different systems. I mean, we're one system that does both transaction processing and machine learning. You don't have to deal with one system that's optimized for transaction processing and then another system that is optimized for machine learning. We do both within the same cluster here. So we do a lot of the same workflow steps that you have to do, and I'll talk about that, but it's all co-located here within the single platform. And what that means, uh, practically speaking, is that you can do incremental updates to the model, that you, you have the opportunity to do big um, historical mass jobs here, uh, but you can also do faster incremental updates to the model because all the data is here. The only difference between training on years worth of data versus training on last week's worth of data is really, it comes down to how you construct the query. And so it's not any kind of an architectural change, it is simply a, uh, a, a, a time constraint in how you want to pull out the data. So this is where the continuous machine learning and the continuous machine learning at scale come in. Okay, the, uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you a lot of material here that I think is very similar to those uh, you know, who worked with the Ignite uh, platform before, but we really use the same partition data structure for machine learning that we uh, do for the transaction processing. So for example, you have a, a set of records here in partition one and copies of those uh, records in partition two. So that if you bring partition one down for any reason, if it fails or if you bring it down for some kind of a rolling update, the transaction processing, the cache gets, puts, the SQL queries, all of those things that they continue running because the second backup copy here merely takes over. And so the application really doesn't know or care that there's been a reduction in the number of nodes here because the, uh, the partition data set gives you that uh, failover and redundancy. Well, we do the same thing with the, the training. So just as the transactional data set is, is backed up, the training, the, the MapReduce training uh, for machine learning, which by the way, lends itself to parallel replicated processing that it works the same way. You are doing a training job on both of these nodes here, and if the first node is brought down for you know, rolling upgrade, the second one 
which is already at the same point in the training cycle, will simply uh, run the completion as it did before, you know, the processing, the training. And so your application node, the one that is uh, orchestrating the, the model, uh, the machine learning pipeline, will still get the results from this particular map phase and will still be able to reduce all of the, the map phases into that, that model. Okay. So let's talk about some of the uh, uh, deployment patterns now. This diagram that I'm showing here is, uh, I think it's a very common representation of how machine learning pipelines typically work. Okay, and so this is not in any way unique to, you know, uh, grid gain or, or anyone else. It, it, in, in most cases, it's a very complex iterative pipeline. Uh, the, the blue items that I show at the top here are they represent third party uh, products for um, ML ops for auto ML, and there's a bunch of good ones there. Uh, it might be, you know, if you want to define a Tableau as being part of your auto ML um, um, tool bench where you can do static analysis on data, then we, we support that. So that's not really our focus. Our focus is more on running all of these steps here in a massively parallel. Uh, resilient environment and so the uh, you know you start out with the operational data of course the transaction data that uh, you need to convert it into a, a numeric format that can be done by the training algorithm and then as part of training you go through a uh, model selection process the assumption is that you're going to have to run training processes uh, hopefully in parallel uh, to more quickly select those models uh, when you evaluate their performance, uh, and then pick those for moving into production. Then you move them into production. This is what I'm calling a predictive workflow here, that this might be doing anything from a real time per transaction response to something a bit more batch oriented. And so here is where your external system begins feeding in the new operational data and you're doing your prediction. And then part of the continuous uh, machine learning is that you constantly evaluate the predictions. Um, this can be done in many different, you know, periodic uh, timelines. If it depends on your business, if you're in like a rapidly changing, uh, you know, retail business, then you might want to be evaluating, uh, given how quickly product uh, preferences and buying preferences change, that you may want to do this, you know, on a weekly or monthly basis. But it's really up to you that we don't impose any any kind of restrictions in terms of how frequently you want to do this performance assessment. You simply compare the predicted value with the actual value, and then you can do that out in the cluster at very high throughput. And so depending on how your data science team says, you know, it's time for us to update the model, that you, you can update the model and then go through this cycle again but it's a much more iterative, incremental, and uh, much closer to the speed of business than a traditional uh, batch you know, kind of operation. So I, I very roughly, just to kind of simplify this, I mean, I, I didn't want to talk about all of these different steps here. So I'm just kind of, I'll talk about building the predictive model, which is um, you, you do all of the, the, you know, the big batch processing if necessary to, to produce the, the um, predictive model that you're going to use to predict for transactions. Uh, transactions, and then using the deployed model. And then just keep this in mind that we, we keep this all in the same architecture. You don't have to like redeploy or move models around, okay? So here's, uh, uh, I have about five pattern slides. Uh, the first one I think is the most common when people think of machine learning, they think of these big batch training operations and we support that very well. That's kind of a foundation. So uh, I put like little numbered steps here just to kind of make it you know, easy to, easier to understand. But assuming that you have somebody, uh, a data science person, you know, working with a data engineering person, they are going to make use with this first step here that they're going to kick off a, uh, a machine learning workflow using a, uh, all of the Ignite libraries, the machine learning libraries that are already resident on the, uh, the Ignite client. Okay, and so as this first step, and I'll be talking later about the wide variety of algorithms that we support, and we've got a bunch of them. But essentially, you have a cluster here that I, I show four here, but you may very well have, um, you know, a hundred. You know, if you're if you're trying to train on petabytes of data, 
the more the better, but the architecture is the same. That you pick your algorithm and then the client will push the code to do the uh, extracting, the pre-processing, the training, and the evaluation for accuracy, that it will push that code out to all of these nodes here. These nodes are primarily, the, the only long-term thing that they have in them is the data, the model uh, training operation, the machine learning workflow is temporary, that is pushed out using kind of a Lambda style of programming that it runs its job and then you deallocate it and then you return the model result back here or um, you know to add that to your repository and, and use that for subsequent steps so the the information that is co-located here so there's no um, data shuffling there's no etl that we partition the data and the workflows in such a way that these all run within their nodes so uh, much less network traffic i mean you have network traffic basically when you push code to the clusters but they run independently, um, pulling out their historical data and then running their compute tasks. And so with this third stage here, when they're done with that, during the, uh, you know, think of the, the three as being the, the map phase and the four as being uh, the reduce phase. Now you have a model here, and now you can communicate back with your, uh, your workbench, your auto ML or, you know, ML ops people, um, you know, the data science people or whoever you have managing this process. Okay, now the the important thing to keep in mind here that I latency constraint, this is a batch run, you know, this is not like milliseconds or anything like that. But if you're a customer uh, using a traditional machine learning, um, you know, analytics platform that is centralized, is vertically scalable, but centralized, where you're taking, you know, 30 hours to run every training task, that drastically cuts down on your ability to run multiple models and to do what if scenarios. I mean, if, if every time um, you, you can literally do dozens of runs on the data for some of these jobs before you find models that are actually uh, useful enough to use in a production setting. And if you take, you know, 30 hours to do this, then it's, it's no longer feasible. You just have to, to live with um, predictive models that are just not very effective. But if you um, drop this down to like an approximately one over node count type reduction, if you're using 10 Ignite nodes and you take this, you know, from 30 hours down to three hours or even faster, uh, then think about how many more of these uh, um, machine learning jobs you can do. And so this is the kind of performance improvement that we see. It may not be totally linear. You know, if you add 10 nodes, it may not be 10 times faster, but if it's eight times faster, seven times faster, then not only can you run them faster serially, but you can actually do more in parallel as well. And for a lot of the new um, machine learning algorithms, it's, it's parallel processing that you run multiple models in parallel. And then that way you find out quickly which models are the best to use for your business. Okay. So this is the one and only slide for the building predictive model, since this is the one where you're creating the model. I have a few more slides here about using the model. And so this is where we start getting into this, into the actual production deployment. So in this case, I'm talking, I'll call it real time, you know, real time, maybe, uh, you know, maybe milliseconds, it may be, you know, a couple minutes. Um, if you're a, a storefront, uh, some sort, you know, if you're a, an e-commerce website or a physical storefront, you know, where people come in to buy products and you want to make real-time offerings to them based on a very quick uh, call to the, uh, the machine learning algorithm, you know, based on this person's past history, what kinds of additional upsell products can we sell them? But the point is, is that this is a quick turnaround time. And so here's the kind of the rough um, you know, the, the client layer here is no longer your machine lot, uh, machines, uh, uh, you know, your data science workbench. Now these are actual um, applications, business applications. So the zero here means, you know, from the training run, we've already put the model up into some clients, so it's available for use. And then I'm showing kind of a forward deployed model here where you have an application that's busily doing uh, transactions, uh, cash puts, gets, you know, SQL queries with the operational database here. But as part of that, it is also in, in line that is making a request to the model uh, here saying, 
Okay, so we, we know, um, you know, based on this uh, customer's purchase history, what's their likelihood that they're going to buy, you know, plant, uh, product A or product B? Um, you know, if you're on a website, you want to know that because you, you want to, in, in the interest of uh, revenue capture, that you want to make offerings to them in a way that is most likely to lead to a sale, right? You don't want to offer them things that they're going to likely refuse and then you're just kind of wasting time. There's other situations where you want this kind of real-time turnaround. A good one is fraud prevention. You've probably heard about many fraud prevention use cases here where you want to know ahead of time, is this likely to be fraud or not, okay? And so I'm showing this here as kind of a, uh, this is a, a, a bi-directional protocol that occurs. You have an application here that's talking to an Ignite transaction client, which is also talking to an Ignite model. And this is kind of a round trip that needs to be done fairly quickly. There are options, and I, I, uh, you know, I'm showing these as different boxes here. But I, I mean, depending on your application, and then, you know, this really depends on how your application is structured. That you can deploy all of these within the same JVM, and I, I'm, I'm speaking to Java developers here, of course. Or you can put them in the same node. That you can have different processes, or you can have them in the same cluster. So these can all be co-located together depending on what kind of a round trip you want here. So once you get the prediction, the, uh, that prediction is going to lead to somebody either, you know, not, let, let me use a healthcare example. Um, that, that prediction might be, you know, will this person be readmitted for the same condition because uh, hospital readmissions are a big problem. And if the, if the model, predicts that somebody will likely have to come back in, you know, 14 days, then you can, before you check the patient out, then the application here has the opportunity to address that, to minimize the risk of their being readmitted. So let's say that, uh, you know, they predict no readmission, uh, and then they go ahead and they write the transaction here, but then it turns out when you look at, at the when you do this evaluation phase, you find out you know twenty percent of the people that we said would not be readmitted that they were readmitted. So what that says is there's some need for this model to be um, you know updated here, right? And so what I'm talking about here now in this particular case is that the old TP updates and predictions and actual performance that they are both being written side by side here. Again, if you're dealing with millions of transactions per day, you want this to be a process that runs massively in parallel, that you don't want to have to pull out every transaction uh, in the recent history and then do that comparison. So this is the general workflow that I, I have articulated here. Okay, so let's talk about something, uh, uh, this is something that I've worked in. And again, I've, you know, calling things real time and near real time, I mean, you know, it's a semantic distinction. We, we all may have different definitions of that. But uh, um, I've done some, uh, you know, cl claim, claims processing, um, you know, architectures in the past. And so if you think about claims processing, and I'll talk about healthcare claims processing, that when you're treating a, uh, a patient, that it's not like you withhold treatment to them based on whether they pay or not, right? That the the, the transaction, you know, the um, the treatment transaction is processed, and then hopefully after the fact, you hope to recover some of the cost of that during the claims, uh, you know, processing uh, stage. So I'm showing this as a one directional arrow here that this client does not have to go back to the, uh, you know, the clinical system or whatever. It's a straight through operation, but even if it is straight through, you still want to do some kind of prediction on this, uh, this item. Well, what kind of prediction do you want to do? A good example in the claims processing world is that you want to predict what is the uh, expected dollar value of that claim and when do you think you can get it back? And so some claims have a higher dollar value that they may be closer or more likely to, um, be processed at the asking amount, whereas other claims may be uh, just because of, of some of the uh, characteristics of the treatment that they may be lower value or that they may be less likely to collect it. And so these are all things that you can use to model in a regression system, for example. And so these claims are being written in, you know, in the millions per day or whatever, and you still want to get some kind of a predicted expected value from that claim. So that's where the prediction is working. You know, this may not be 
per claim here, but it can be in you know small batches of claims. And I'm calling it near real time because if you're powering a workflow, if there's a staff workflow that has to process these applications, um, you know, hourly or whatever, that you want to know what are the the most valuable claims, let's do those first. And so it's a workflow prioritization scheme. But once again, you are still writing um, the the data into the cluster here that you're making full use of the parallel uh, data management for Ignite, but then you are also um, again, doing the accuracy tracking in a very scaling, uh, scaling uh, performant manner, that evaluating the, the accuracy of um, analytics and training algorithm is not something that needs to be done with a big batch extract where you're running a lengthy report. It can be done continuously in cluster. It can provide the feedback to the model and then tell the, the data science people whether, you know, this model isn't performing or it um, I think more typical is that it performed well at first, uh, you know, for certain conditions or for certain hospital uh, networks, but it's not really performing as we had hoped for some of the others. Okay, and so I'm showing this uh, the step here where let's assume that once this is done, there's some sort of a workflow program uh, that hourly or daily or whatever that the the uh, claims adjudication team is going to want to look at this and say, okay, well, let's pull out the you know the top 200 claims here, and then you can do these fast queries here. That you again, you don't have to be doing a big batch extract and populating a separate system. You can just pull out all of the queries at high speed here, and then feed them into your workflow system. Okay. So uh, kind of a, a variance on that theme. Um, a lot of uh, deployment scenarios now that they involve putting your predictive service as, as a, a, I'll call it a predictive model service. And so we're pulling the model out here that if you have like a bunch of clients coming in, if you have some data streams, you know, coming from IoT, if you have others coming from a website, whatever, that it might make sense to have multiple clients here. And so you want to pull out the model in some kind of a shared service. and. Um, we have service grid for that, and there's a number of advantages to pulling a model out as a shared service. For one thing, it's reusable by many different clients. This in a shared service that you can wrap it in security layers. You can do things like um, contextual-based routing. And some of these clients, even though they're making the same predict call on this, they, they may have different priorities. And so these are all things that you can put within the service here. Uh, one feature that we have that is pretty cool for this is that if you you should replicate the service if you want to create another cluster here, that this this is the cache cluster down here, but you may want another uh, a, a machine a, a predictive model service cluster that is fault tolerant that can do load balancing, and what you can do here. Um, is that you can take models that you can create a single model. I mean, you want all of these instances of the model to be identical. Um, and so you can take a model that was trained with one training run. You can either pull it in uh, from the Ignite uh, repository, or you can parse in if you have another favorite model from Spark or Ex Extreme Gradient Boost, you can pull that in and then you can populate each of these so that they all have the same model and that they're all completely um, stateless you know, with re regards to the, uh, you know, the inputs and the outputs. Okay, so think of this, uh, um, if, if, if you're going to be using a model service, I think this is actually a very common deployment pattern that when people create models, if they want many different um, systems to be using them, right? And this doesn't even have to be the same algorithm here, that this can be uh, a comprehensive modeling service that is gathering performance information, then you have this one stop uh, place to go for where the, the business people and the data science people can compare notes and then see how the predictive service is going, right? And then finally, last but not least, uh, I'll bring up the batch process again. This is not, uh, you know, the latency is. Uh, it's 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 a fast um it, it's still a batch run i mean you know you can still be thinking about hours here but again the idea is that you want to take the um the the the, the run here the training run and you, you you don't want it to run days you want it to run in hours or minutes and those are things that we can do um we we can grow the cluster dynamically that if you're doing transactions here, you're running your transaction business on these clusters, but you know that you're going to need more uh, compute power. 
you can add more Ignite nodes to the cluster. You can grow it temporarily to provide more capacity to do the machine learning stuff on it and then shrink it down again. So we provide that flexibility. When you add nodes, all of the transaction data on here will balance and scale up to run on more nodes to free up more capacity on each node. Um, so the, uh, the reason I bring up this case here is that there's a very common uh, machine learning problem that is it's called clustering and I'll talk a little bit about that. All of the other examples I showed you that they have data where you already understand what the output classes are or that you look at the input and you say this is the output class or this is the output value. But there's a lot of data out there especially in things like healthcare where you have a bunch of uh, it's voluminous data that it's millions of, of patients and hundreds of columns and so this clustering uh, exercise is where you're trying to look for segments or to think that it's kind of like a customer segment problem that you're trying to find out, you know, some of those customers are big spenders. Some of them are, uh, they're not big spenders. Some of them might need convincing. And so you can actually break them down into groups. But this takes this kind of an architecture here and it's typically some form of a clustering problem. And it's called unlabeled data where you have the data but there is no column in the data that says this is a high, uh, you know, this is a big spending customer, that you have to create that synthetically and you have to use this kind of a, of a uh, long running batch process to do that, all right? So uh, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, I, I did a, you know, I, I, there's probably many, many different deployment patterns out there. And I, I imagine some of you who work with these you know, architectural patterns probably have some different, uh, uh, you know, variations on that. So now let's talk about uh, Apache Ignite and some of the features for that. So this is the uh, kind of the complete stack here. So uh, this shows a lot of the different um, APIs that we support, and I, I should have put SQL in here since that's probably the most common now, and we have very good support for SQL. Uh, we provide all of these algorithms out of the box, okay, so they're all available, and I'll talk about uh, TensorFlow. I'm not going to talk a lot about deep learning, which is what TensorFlow is. I'll mention it a couple of times, but, um, you know, that is such a popular framework that we just, we just integrate to uh, your existing TensorFlow platform rather than provide our own because it does the job well. And so that's the one that's not exact, you know, we, we don't really encourage people to use any of the deep learning stuff that we have. In fact, I'm not sure that we've enhanced that at all. We just talk to, uh, we work with TensorFlow. But all of the other uh, machine learning algorithms in, are in here. Everything that we do works on distributed machine learning data sets. That the old model of machine learning where you have a big single workstation will not cut it when you have terabytes or petabytes of data. It has to be distributed. So everything that we do is distributed and it uses kind of a MapReduce paradigm that runs on top of a compute grid. So every one of these steps that you do here is on the client and then you pass it out as a MapReduce task to be run on the, the cluster without having to install, uh, you know, to shut down and install. It's all done dynamically. Okay, uh, I, I realize this slide is kind of complicated, but basically I, I'm just I'm just reiterating that we do every every pipeline use case. You know, we we either do it ourselves or we allow you to do it by pulling in third parties. And so these are kind of like the, the main. I kind of group, grouped them together here. So everything from taking your transaction data, pre-processing it to doing your model building, and then finally to deploy it where you're actually running the model and then you're not done when you deploy the model because you need to, to make sure that it's tracking with, um, you know, customer behavior, right? So here's, uh, this is a big one, you know, normalization scaling. And so this is, uh, you know, kind of data science 101 here, but you need to have this. And so in, in essence, what this is doing is it's taking, and this is something that needs to be done at scale, right? That if, if you have a terabyte of data, you need to do this before you can actually do the, uh, the, the training. And so th this is essentially changing the representation of the data. You're not changing the underlying data here. That, um, you know, a good example would be if you're selling products, you know, global products, just because one uh, 
price for that is in yen and another price is in US dollars, that does not mean that the underlying value of the product is different. It's just, you know, yen is one representation and dollar is another. And so these tools here uh, help you to normalize that and scale it in such a way that the machine learning run is faster, that it doesn't have to deal with these differences in the representation and it can be more accurate. Okay, so that's one. This is another big one here dealing with categorical values. And we do this again, we do this at, at speed in parallel. If you have, you know, in a simple example here, you know, you have uh, three colors, you know, green is represented as a number three, tan is two and one. You can't put this as is into a machine learning algorithm because it makes no sense to say that the color green is three times the size of the color pink. That doesn't make sense. And so from a categorical value perspective, you have to convert it into something that you literally have to create, you know, like a blue dimension, a pink dimension, and a tan dimension, and then show, you know, like a true false for each of those. Now, you know, if you only have four categorical values, um, this works fine. If you're doing a medical application that has hundreds of categories, you know, hundreds of disease codes, it, it won't work. And so there's other encoding mechanisms such as string encoding that are more suitable for uh, categorical values that have lots of unique values. Okay, so that's another one. Uh, the clustering, again, you know, I label data. So think of this as data. If, if you're a drug researcher, you have a big population of people, you're trying to ascertain, uh, you're trying to divide people into segments such as, you know, they're likely to have an adverse reaction to this drug, they're not likely, or uh, it's uh, uh, an intermediate risk. And so you're trying to break them into levels. And so with the clustering, and uh, th this is a time consuming operation here because you have a bunch of data here. I'm showing a data that kind of breaks down into three relations, but it might not be three, it might be eight, and a lot of times the populations may not be as obviously separated as this. And so it, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky iterative process. It's one that needs to be done. And it's one that benefits uh, business-wise anyway from the ability to do it uh, at scale, you know, with very high volumes and in reasonable time. And so some, you know, population segmentation, it's interesting, you know, whether it's health or in retail, it's still a population segmentation problem, you know, in the health uh, areas, it's, it's, you know, risk, whereas in retail, it, it's spending patterns, right? And so there's just a number of different ways in which uh, this kind of clustering is needed. And then, of course, when people think about the prediction piece, you know, the actual prediction, there's two main classes. There's um, here, you know, let's pretend these are likely fraud and that these are likely not fraud, right? And so that, those are two different output classes. And the prediction values are, uh, you know, the outputs are fraud, not fraud. It's a numerical estimate. And so if you're trying to estimate the, the, the cost per square foot uh, of a property, or that example I use about the claims processing, where you look at all the, the input values on the claim, and then you try to predict the value of the claim. You know, if this is a high value thing, you might want to process that sooner, that you, you put that in the high value bucket and you process that as soon as possible. And then uh, last but not least, TensorFlow. I mean, uh, like I said, I'm not going to talk a lot about it here, but uh, uh, most of the enhancements that you know I've been discussing are for structured, you know, tabular data. But we also allow uh, that we, we provide an adapter so you can use us for uh, image data classification as well. Okay, just to summarize. Uh, so I, I've been you know, you know talking about the you know the machine learning uh, stuff here. But the reason that we're able to do the machine learning at scale is because we can do the transaction processing at scale. And you know what? It doesn't, it doesn't benefit you at all to have one system that's extremely good at transaction processing and one system that's extremely good at machine learning because the difficulty of converting the data, moving the data that you have to buy uh, expensive ETL products and uh, a host of other things that uh, because of the fact that, that we have such scale, and uh, unlike some of the other um, machine learning products out there that we do both the transaction processing and the training, that there's a number of good products out there that do training, but that you're still faced with the, the issue, you know, the cost of getting the training data and then um, moving that, extracting it and moving it in a way that you don't have to with us because it can all be done locally within each node and it's a much faster, more iterative process. 
So um, you know, I, I didn't really have a lot of time to talk about a lot of the different APIs here. I'll just show you what you get with the uh, you know the examples to give you an idea that it's it's low level. Uh, that's both a strength and a weakness. I mean, it's low level Java, so uh, uh, you, you you need to be fairly uh, skilled with Java to make use of this. But at the same time, you can come up with a very on on the plus side, you can come up with a very high performing machine learning workflow that works with anything else that you have in your organization. And the, the, the benefit, of course, is that you can close the gap once and for all. You can actually have a, an online, iterative, you know, continuous learning installation uh, that actually works with your existing you know, data science work, also works with your existing uh, OLTP systems. All right. Just going to... Um, you know, this is like the last few minutes here. I, I wanted to make sure that there was some time for, uh, you know, Q and A. So I kind of rushed through this. The um, <clears throat> everything, and I'll I'll show you this. Um, so e everything is in this uh, this org Apache .ignite examples .ml. I, uh, we're we're going to give you these slides later, and so I wanted to capture these in slides so you could look at them later. But basically, everything. Is in the org.apache.ignite.examples.ml package. And so the one that I like to show, uh, this tutorial uh, here, it runs everything uh, start to finish, multiple steps. So you can see and compare in kind of a, a simple, you know, straight through batch operation how things um, work. Um, and so let me go ahead and uh, uh, let's see here. So I'm going to show you now. So um, here is the uh, the uh, Ignite uh, examples. Um, if you uh, you have a couple of different options for doing this, I mean you can download the whole um, Ignite uh, zip file and then extract it into your your Mac, your Linux, or your Windows environment, and then you import the examples directory. And then with your Maven build file, which you have all the way down at the bottom here, you can build the whole thing. Now, we also have these examples in a GitHub repo. So if you have an existing Ignite setup and you want to just pull these down, then uh, you can do that as well. So this is the, um, you know, kind of a, a quick um, view of the whole ML package here. So let me just kind of go through. So this is, uh, these are all the packages here. So you have some clustering examples here. And for those of you who've worked with clustering, you know, Gaussian mean and k-means and all those are. And so this is what you can take to characterize unlabeled data if you want to if you want to do like segmentation analysis, for example. We have a number of algorithms here like this, where if you're a real hotshot uh, Java developer and you want to write your own pre-processing code, if you have like a, an extremely unique data set. Um, then you can wade in and do all that fun stuff. Everything that you see here that shows inferencing uh, has to pertain to real-time prediction. And so it's going to have things like predict calls in where you actually, you have the model. Here you're, you're pulling in the model, uh, a previously stored model. Here you have some examples where uh, it, if those of you who know who H2O is, and we have a parser for them, one, uh, several for Spark, and you see with the Spark example here that we we support a number of different uh, models that you produce from Spark, and we pull them in from common formats such as PMML and uh, Parquet and others. And then the, here's XGBoost. So I'm showing you stuff that's new with a 2.8 version here, and uh, so on and, and so forth here. So um, just about every um, if, if you're if you're working closely with data science if you're a data engineer, then you have a lot of different things here that you can collaborate with them on. Um, and then down here, of course, we have like a bunch of different uh, common data sets. We wanted this to be, you know, kind of a self-contained example. So a lot of these are like canned files of limited size. Um, I know for me, uh, you know, myself, I've actually, uh, one of the engineers on our team put together a data generator. So I, I like to do examples with an actual data generator so I can generate a lot of data that I need to run on a whole bunch of nodes, right? And that's, uh, you know, I mean, if you're interested in getting my help to do that, I'd be happy to help. 
but right now a lot of these are just uh, the, these are very common data sets that you find on Kaggle and UCI and many others and so on. they're all here uh, they're ready for you to use and uh, I'm just kind of going through and showing you a bunch of different examples here just to let you know how complete this is so now um, I went ahead and I ran this main tutorial here. It takes a few minutes. I'm just running it on my little uh, Windows laptop. Um, you know, I think that a, uh, for those of you who may have access to a cluster, uh, you know, on the AWS or Azure somebody, I think it would be a, a cool exercise to go ahead and run this, um, uh, you know, with more data on a bigger cluster. But essentially in this tutorial example here, Every one of these steps shows different examples, and I'll, I'll uh, walk through the output here, <clears throat> of all the different algorithms you can do, and every one of them compares what kind of benefit you get in terms of accuracy. And uh, again, accuracy is how you compare models, and this varies uh, based on your data set, that uh, one model may perform better than another on a certain data set, but then on your data set, it may, it may not be as effective. And so here's all the different steps here where you can take a look and you can compare all the different outputs. And uh, like I said, I already ran it. And so I'm, I'm just going to, uh, I, I annotated some of the outputs. So uh, if you run this in your IDE, make sure that you turn off the buffer size uh, limit, you know, which I did in Eclipse here, because this is like a ton of stuff that's dumped out to the console. Or you may want to capture it in a file. So let's look at the Titanic example. And again, like, like I said, unfortunately, it's just like a little canned data set, but it's still something that you, you can see how these things work. <coughs> in, um, so here, the first time uh, that we run the uh, the training algorithm is just a simple decision tree. We we just look at three uh, purchase class. Uh, so the purchase class siblings present and parents present so there are actually three columns within the titanic data set that show that information and just with those three columns we pull them out and then we train on them that we get a predictive accuracy of about 71 percent so what that means is um, 71 or 72 percent of the time we can look at a passenger and on these three criteria we can predict whether they uh, they lived or died okay so that's that's not great actually but that that's uh you know obviously when you start getting close to like 50 that, that's a useless model so let me go to the next one <clears throat> so this next one uh, we we uh, we added missing values and so uh some of the values are missing and so that's another pre-processing step that there's a way that the machine learning algorithm needs to have a value uh, you don't want to give it a null because that's confusing and so you need to provide missing values and so there's a number of different ways you can do that you can look for averages you can look for means and so you you know that you're you're messing with the data here and that you're changing the characteristic but you your data scientist looks at this and says you know what that, that this is it's still worthwhile you know i mean the the increase in accuracy is it's understood and so here, when we add missing values, uh, we we don't really add very much, okay? So, I mean, it went up from like 0.7119, uh, you know, so it, it, it really didn't make much of a difference here. And now if we start adding other features here, like for example, when we add gender and embarkation location, um, evidently, I never knew this, but uh, in the days of the Titanic, evidently some people uh, boarded in, you know, wealthier places than others and the gender. So you would expect, you know, women and children first. And if you were a slightly more up to do passenger, then uh, unfortunately that probably helped uh, you. And so here in this case, we see that the accuracy goes up again, you know, up to 80% now. Okay. So I think you kind of get the gist here. When we add age and fare, um again so you know if you're young and if you paid more for your fare then once again that helped that uh, bumps up your predictive accuracy you know if you tended to be young and had a higher fare paid then it was uh it was more likely that you could predict with more certainty whether they uh, survived or not it's still you know it's just an, an incremental change here and then uh Here's, uh, for, for those of you who've worked with machine learning, you know that overfit, overfitting is always an issue. And uh, it, what overfitting basically means is, you know, you have all this training data 
and you've memorized it. Um, that you've memorized the training data, and when you memorize something, um, you can recall what that exact pattern is, but when you have a pattern that's a little bit different, you no longer uh, recognize it, right? And so when C begins to get, you know, this high with such, uh, you know, just uh, adding a single algorithm here, that, that tends to be suspicious, you know, this 95%, I mean, what did we do to get uh, up to 95% accuracy? And so we, we, I, I think it's overfitting. And so what, what you do to manage overfitting is that you start using steps like test data split. It's called validation. And so one way to do validation of your training model is to, uh, is to split your, your training data and then withhold some of it and then treat that as new data. So when you do a test data split here, you're back down to 0.79. And this is actually a more realistic assessment of the predictive accuracy than the 0.95, right? So this is, again, something that you need to do uh, at scale uh, out on the cluster with you know, terabytes of data, potentially, okay? Uh, and so I, I, I just, uh, so we kind of wrap back to the middle. And so that's basically, um, you know what, I just wanted to call your attention to that because I think that this is really a, a nice uh, set of examples here that have been built up that really allow you to uh, to, to get started very effectively. Um, let's see, we're uh, kind of down to the last few minutes here. So here's some documentation, uh, all of these, uh, you'll get the recording, but then I, I think we'll also release the slides. So you'll get all of these links here. And uh, this is uh, for some of the machine learning experts, you know, some of the, the deep down, uh, you know, data science and analytics stuff. And then uh, we would love for you to join the Apache Ignite community. I know myself, I, I want to get more people actively working with some of the, um, you know, the machine learning stuff. And uh, I guess there's some time for Q&A. And uh, um, I guess we could provide, I think I provided my, uh, my, uh, email address as well. So I'd love to hear back from you guys if, you, if you're interested in next steps or if you want some, you know, advice or pointers from me on how to get started with this. Otherwise, so then I'm done at this point. So uh, let's do some Q&A. So one question that came earlier is um, about TensorFlow. Is that uh, one or two? TensorFlow one or two, do you know? You know, it's been a while since I've checked. Um, that's a good question. I'll, uh, I, I could look into that. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't know how I would convey the answer back to the the person asking the question, but I'd have to look into that. It's been a while since I I checked on the TensorFlow. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we I can we can follow up uh, individually as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then um, another question is around performance. Uh, what kind of performance? Um, impact does having this, um, you know, your training run on the same um, database as a transaction processing system? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, um, I don't think that there's any, you know, one size fits all kind of, uh, um, you know, response to that. So when, when you have an Ignite cluster, you know, and let's, and let's say that you're, you're using the Ignite cluster to do, um, uh, you know, transaction workloads, right? There, there's going to be a certain amount of overhead that you naturally have that uh, if, if, you, if you have a, a cluster of, you know, say 10 machines and at that time of day, if, the, if, if it's relatively lightly loaded that you don't have clients that are performing a lot of transactions and you happen to have um, extra uh, RAM capacity or extra CPU capacity, then you you can in, in most cases you you can safely download and run uh, a, a compute task and that's essentially what a machine learning task is right I mean it's a compute task it's a machine learning compute task that tends to take heap um, so a lot of it depends on how much uh, spare uh, space that you have uh, on your existing transaction cluster now the more scientific answer to that is um, you 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 do a careful analysis. Um, in order to maintain the same throughput that you're enjoying with your currently loaded system, you know, whatever kind of throughput that you're seeing with that, something that, that would be a good idea that is easy to do is that you, you can add more nodes 
uh, to the cluster. Um, you know, if you're a TAN and uh, you know for a fact that you're that you want to maintain your transaction throughput, it's a very simple matter to add Ignite nodes to the cluster. You know, let's say that you add five, and what will happen is that the data that is on the the, the ten nodes that that will be redistributed out to the 15 nodes that you have now, right? And so what that's gonna, what's gonna do is that that's going to create more empty space on the 15 nodes. And then that empty space can uh, be used to run additional compute tasks uh, training on it in such a way that you're adding capacity, uh, but you're not in any way impacting your, uh, your, your transaction throughput. And so it's very dynamic. And so up to, um, you know, and then when you're done with the machine learning piece, uh, then you you can, uh, you know, just turn off uh, or remove those, those uh, you know, five nodes and then have the, the cluster shrink back down to the 10. And then you'll redistribute the data back to those 10 nodes so that they will be more uh, heavily loaded, but they'll only be doing transaction management now, okay? So I, I, I don't know if I answered the question or not, but it, it's, it's a very, uh, it, it, the system is very elastic. That you, you can uh, grow it elastically. And if, if you want to get the machine learning to be done on the existing cluster doing transaction processing, then you have to look at it. And, and the, the tools that we have, you know, this control center and some of the other stuff, they can tell you, you know, we're only using you know, 60% of the uh, you know CPU here, so you can you, you can do the training on it, uh, you know, without impacting your transaction performance. So hopefully that that answers the question. Yep, that was great. Um, thanks. One question um, in terms of setup is uh, how do you prepare and set up the distributed cache data? Yeah, well, um, there's two ways to do that. There's two ways to think of this, okay? If you want to use us uh, as a data grid or a cache in front of, say, Oracle, then uh, what, you know, in a nutshell, what you do is you, you, you first of all, you figure out how much data is in uh, the Oracle database. And let's say that the Oracle database has a whole bunch of historical data but you only want to cache the data, you know, the transactions from the last week, right? And so what, whatever you want to run fast, if, if you want the, the, the last week's worth of data to run fast, then you size the Ignite cluster so that it can hold the last week's worth of data in memory. And then that way it can, it can act as an accelerator, um, you know, for the Oracle data. And by accelerator, I mean a faster, and faster updates too that it, it does right through and all that. Okay, so that's one way to think of it. If you're using us as the database, then you you have more flexibility in, in many respects because you uh, we will grow the system. Uh, so using us as a database, whatever uh, data does not fit in in RAM, you know, in the cache, that we will automatically write to the disk for you, and so your system can grow as much as you want, and then we'll just put it to disk, and then whenever you need something, it'll pull it back into memory automatically. Uh, if the question is about installation, um, it's it's a Java, uh, uh, you know, jar files. And so, you know, in terms of how you put it on the system, let's say that you want to run this on, you know, an eight node cluster, you just put the, the jar classes, uh, you install the jar classes on the eight nodes, and then uh, they attach themselves every time, you know, using the default settings, you, you start up those eight nodes. And if you're using all the default ports and stuff, you just start them up and then they all connect to each other into an eight node cluster. And then the way the caches are created, uh, that, um, it, it uses the Jcache standard. And so uh, the API is, is stuff like, you know, create this cache, create this entry in this cache, create this entry in this cache, um, that kind of thing. Uh, and then we also have an SQL layer. Uh, and then with the SQL, you're, you're using SQL commands and you're creating tables and inserting rows and stuff like that. And then they will automatically be partitioned out to the eight nodes automatically. Um, 
And then if you if you're if you're using a database, then we have what's called a cache loader, where you you have to develop some code that will lead that load the data in from Oracle or whatever, and then put in cache when you need it. Uh, I, uh, hopefully, I answered the question. I mean, it's it's yep. it's basically yeah. I mean, you install the jar files, and then you use API calls to create the caches, and then uh, you either write to a database or you write to our own native persistence. Perfect. All right. Uh, thanks, Ken. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.